Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly internet uh, and online radio uh, uh, podcast in which we uh, examine all things uh, Beatles, both in their history and uh, and uh, the, and their present and in their future and uh, even in other other galaxies, as we'll be finding out in uh, in a few moments. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from Beetle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my uh, three co-hosts. First, the host of the syndicated uh, and uh, and internet radio, Beatles radio uh, show, Every Little Thing, Ken Michaels. Hi, Ken. Hi, Al. How's everyone doing? Great, Ken. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the reporter for uh, Beatles Examiner, uh, who has been busy much of this weekend. In fact, he has a, a breaking story uh, as we're recording this on Monday evening, uh, and that's Steve Marinucci. Hey, Steve. Hey, Al. Hello, everyone. And our resident musicologist, a longtime contributor to, uh, to Beatle Fan Magazine, longtime critic for the New York Times, and currently uh, writing for a number of different publications, doing classical music and other things, and that's Alan Cozen. Hey, Alan. Hey, Al. Hello, everyone. Before we get into our main topic, though, as I said, we do have a piece of uh, of breaking news, and as uh, seems to be happening almost on a weekly basis, it's sad news, and it's the the passing of Alan Rouse, who was uh, well. Actually, you know what? I should have I should have Alan really kind of give you uh, a full kind of bio. On Alan Rouse, he was he was involved with the Beatles anthology and the remasters, but Alan can tell you much more, and uh, and the Love album as well. Basically, yes. Alan Rouse was the uh, was in charge of the archives at Abbey Road, and um, he went on staff there, I think, in 1972, and. Basically, the first job he was given was to copy the entire Beatles uh, archives. Well, uh, probably not in 1972, but apparently early in his career, he was asked to copy the Beatles archives digitally. And he knew where everything was. And so if George Martin needed to come in and, and work, for instance, on the anthology, as you said, or uh, the even the BBC things he was involved with, uh, although that stuff hadn't originally been in EMI's archives, but he was involved with that too. Basically, you would go through Alan Rouse to get the stuff you needed. Uh, and he was basically the overseer as well of the 2009 remasters. And uh, that's basically the story. Uh, you know, he was really sort of a background guy. He wasn't an engineer, so he didn't do the engineering on these projects. But he he was uh, in, involved in, let's say, the quality control of, of the whole uh, remasters project. And uh, so he died apparently today. Right, but his his name was out there enough that it oh, yeah. was it's certainly recognizable to uh, to certainly certainly Beatle audiophiles. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. If you look That's... at the credits on on all those CDs, you'll see him his name right there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. exactly. And actually, yeah, from what I read, he first worked with George Martin when when George was putting together the making of Sgt. Pepper special. Right. And he needed yeah. Alan's help mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He also worked on Live at the BBC. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So that whole, basically that whole generation of Beatles archive releases that have come out sent, beginning with Live at the, uh, at the BBC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's certainly, uh, he's a, a significant piece of uh, more recent uh, Beatle history. And uh once again, a uh, a loss in in the Beatle family. Yeah. Now to our uh, to our topic, and it's it's interesting because this is kind of we're dealing here with fan, a little bit of fantasy, a little bit of speculation, and while this was happening, along comes this rumor that came up uh, within the last week. Uh, Eric Clapton has a new album, and one of the tracks. Um, has a 
uh, basically a guitar part on it, which sounds suspiciously like George Harrison. Only problem is, you know, it's not an archive track. It's part of his new album. And uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, George has been, uh, shall we say, unavailable for nearly 15 years. So, uh, so that's one of those, one of those things that happens in social media these days where suddenly everybody goes crazy over some tiny little bit of speculation. But aside from that, we had decided for this particular show to do something obviously in their, in their post Beatles careers, as opposed to the, uh, the group career where, you know, they really had very little in the way of sidemen, but in their post Beatles career, each of the Beatles worked with a number of different musicians and, and a number of different producers and all. And so we, uh, we thought it might be interesting to kind of speculate on who we would like to see. And this would be somebody who would be living or dead. Perhaps somebody who was not even a contemporary of a particular Beatle. We could basically select, in in this case, three selections of somebody we would like to have seen or possibly could still see uh, one of the Beatles work with as you know either as a uh, supporting player possibly as a producer possibly with the uh, the the particular beetle acting as a producer so i thought why don't we start why don't we start with john lennon because that's probably the most problematic uh of these and, and the the one probably most uh uh most dealing with speculation and I'll uh, I'll throw my my three nominations into the pool and and see what uh, uh, what comes up. By the way, that sound you have in the you hear in the background that is Steve scratching out all of his selections as soon as they mentioned anything about a producer. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's all right. <laughs> Go. Okay. Um, now. As I said, the, this could be somebody who who was not particularly a contemporary of John Lennon's. And in this, my, my first selection is definitely not a contemporary because his band, U2, uh, released their first album uh, not long before, I believe, Ken, I think it was, what, 1979 when they released their when. Their yeah, first album the first, came out. The first few U2 albums, I think, were it's definitely late seventies. Yeah. So seventy eight or seventy nine. Yeah. Right. Right. So you know they were really just kind of getting uh, getting their uh, their career going when John's career suddenly ended. But I, um, Bono, has always acknowledged that he is a a Lennon disciple, and I would have loved to have seen. John Lennon and Bono work together, whether it was, you know, on stage uh, or in the studio as fellow musicians or with perhaps John producing Bono, either solo or with you two, whoever. Uh, I think I think that would have been a great match. Uh, my second selection is somebody that uh, that that John actually talked about in the interviews that he gave. In fact, one particular interview that he gave to Rolling Stone uh, two days before he was killed. And but he had also mentioned uh, being very interested in the in the career progression of Bruce Springsteen. Um, as it happens, Bruce's album The River, which in fact is the basically the uh the theme of his current tour uh, the, the the anniversary the 35th anniversary of of the release of the river the river was released basically right around the river and also the single uh hungry heart were released right around the same time that starting over and double fantasy were released in october and november of 1980 
And in fact, uh, Bruce uh, was playing at the Spectrum on um, on the night of uh, December 8th. And there is, uh, <laughs> there's been speculation that, um, uh, that he may have, in fact, been playing Point Blank, which is a track from mm. from the river at the time that the shots were were fired, and it's not out of the realm of possibility. But anyway, uh, John had actually expressed a great deal of interest in the the progression of Bruce's career, and he uh, he mentioned liking Hungry Heart quite a bit. And he was very interested to uh, to hear the river, whether he actually got to hear it or, or not. We uh, we don't know. But um, again, considering the uh, the 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 arc of of Bruce's career, especially as he got beyond, as John mentioned in that interview for Rolling Stone, uh, kind of beyond doing songs about cars and girls, and writing about. Uh, more serious matters, which in fact Bruce began doing with his next album, Nebraska. Again, I would love to have seen John Lennon and Bruce Springsteen work together uh, again, either whether it was on stage or in the studio or um, in in whatever form. I think it would have been absolutely great. Uh, my third selection is basically based on one TV appearance, and that is the um, uh, the appearance by Chuck Berry on the Mike Douglas show the week that uh, that John and Yoko co-hosted the show, and John and uh, and Chuck performed uh, performed Johnny Be Good, and uh, I I I would love to have seen at some point the two of them work together, perhaps perhaps in something similar to. To what Keith Richards did with uh, with Chuck, hopefully with uh, hopefully with Chuck acting less of a dick than uh, than he <laughs> did, than he did during the filming of uh, what was it Hail Hail Rock and Roll was that the title of the film? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, but again, I would have I've loved would have loved to have seen, especially since let's face it, Chuck was was one of of John's idols. His absolute musical idols. I think it would have been a you know a musical match made in heaven, it, even if it was only for a couple of shows or maybe an album, whatever. So so those are my three nominations for who I would have liked to have seen John Lennon work with. And, I have a question. Yeah, please. Are you picking in the case of Bono and Bruce Springsteen those two because? You're fans of their work, or do you really? Can you hear it in your head, John yeah. Lennon working with them? Because if I hear, say, a, a U2 song, it's not like I can hear John singing it. It's just my own personal, my own reaction to it, his own musical style, Bono style, or mm-hmm. Springsteen style, for that matter. Yeah. When uh, when I when I'm picking uh, the artist that I have, I'm trying to envision one that kind of makes sense where I can actually hear a Beatle sing with another artist and uh, collaborate as a songwriter and vocally. You know, are you thinking about that as you're choosing these or are they mm-hmm. just favorite artists of yours? No, um, I'm thinking in, in terms of, uh, of musical compatibility, definitely. And I think uh, certainly in the case of Bono, uh, there's, a, there's a great deal of musical compatibility. I could, I could yeah, I could easily see um, John singing... I don't know. I will follow. Now, obviously, you know his voice was much different than uh, than Bono's. Sure. But uh, but I think musically they share a lot of the same uh, a lot of the same roots. Okay. And uh, and I think the same probably and really the same with with Bruce because his certainly his musical roots are much the same as John's, even though he was you know somewhat younger you know, close to a decade younger. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I, I, I think again, they, they were definitely musical, uh, maybe not soulmates, but certainly, uh, certainly very compatible musically. Right. And, um, and sure I could, I could see them, 
I could see them working together. You know, there are people that uh, that would say that um, that it's tough to imagine Bruce and Paul working together, and yet they, at least on stage, they have uh, they have worked together, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and and very well. Right. So uh, so I don't think. Yeah, I think. Uh, certainly, in those two cases, it's 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 absolutely within the realm of possibility, and certainly in the case of Chuck Berry, it would be. Okay. Okay. Uh, in fact, why don't we uh, why don't we go with Ken and see what his selections are? Well, before I do say my three here, I wanted mm-hmm. to make sure some of the artists that I've listed for all four of the Beatles are artists that have worked with them already, but haven't worked extensively with them. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, mine too. That's cool. So in the case of John, I mean, to me, it, it's a natural to me to think of John with David Bowie. Mm-hmm. And as much as I love fame and, and their cover of Across the Universe together, I just think that there's a lot of similarities between the two. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the fact that, you know, David was constantly wanting change. John was certainly that way in the Beatles. There's no doubt about that. And um, I think that there's, you know, I think that... Um, John would have fed off that. Mm-hmm. I think John would have loved to have worked with someone who was constantly creative, had a very fertile mind, never wanted to repeat himself, and he would have found that challenging. And I think that he respected David that way. And I think personality-wise, I think they got along fine. And we all know, certainly since David's passing, you've read these quotes about how he thought the world of John Lennon. So right. I think that uh, those two would have been fantastic together. And mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of artists who the Beatles have done one-offs with, or maybe a couple of songs, and you wish that maybe there'd be a full album with that artist. And David Bowie, if John Lennon made a full album with David Bowie, that would have been fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And likewise, mm-hmm. I would say the exact same thing about Elton John. Elton mm-hmm. John is someone who greatly admired John, and just listen to whatever gets you through the night. What a fantastic track that was. There was so much life in that track that Elton mm-hmm. brought to it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just think those two would have been natural together. Yeah, I, I, that's a duplicate of mine because I, I was imagining how the two of them would have. I mean, they, they've, they've done single tracks, but they haven't really done an extensive project. And I would have loved to have seen them do a whole, thing, a whole album together. I think that would have been really interesting. Yeah, not only that, but... You've got certain cases of artists who are known for just writing melodies, Elton being a primary example of that. So apply mm-hmm. John Lennon's lyrics and also working on the melody maybe with Elton and see what you can come up with. It might have been fascinating. And just mm-hmm. knowing how much the two of them you know, fed off each other and how well they worked together. Also on Elton's version of Lucy in the Sky and his cover of One Day at a Time. You know, They both loved each other so much. I think that that would have carried over into the music. You would have felt that, I think. And also, I was thinking Ray Davies. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Because Ray is a big fan of John's, and I know he, he specifically points out John of all the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And certainly lyrically, the two of them were so brilliant, and melodically too. But um, Ray Davies, kind of like John, comes up with some really strong, biting, cynical lyrics, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I can easily see the two of them working together. So, um, and the Kinks, really, of all the other great British invasion bands, to me, come closest to the Beatles. Yeah. As far as their pop sensibilities, you know, a lot of their music was was a mixture of very strong melodic stuff, very poppy, but also with an edge to it, and certainly an edge lyrically with Ray's lyrics in particular. So, um, yeah, there's so many other artists I picked for John, but those would probably be my top three. I did mention in my list here Chuck Berry, too, mm-hmm. because John is one of those people who, when it comes to Chuck Berry's music, if anyone's ever going to cover it, whose voice is better than John's? Exactly. You know, it's kind of like Paul mm-hmm. with Little Richard. You know, it's, it's the same thing. So, um, yeah, I would pick the three that I said, and, and sorry if it's artists that John already worked with. But I think John picked two of the finest people there that he could collaborate with. Mm -hmm. Uh, David Bowie and Elton John. Absolutely. And and, and throw in uh, Ray Davies. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, it was actually David Bowie's passing that 
put this germ in my mind about something like this because of the fact that uh, that you know he only got the chance to work with uh, with John the one really the one time, mm-hmm. and it would have been it would have been really fascinating to see him work uh, with uh, with John more throughout mm-hmm. their you know throughout their their career you know as time as time wore on right but um and and also to see if possibly um possibly if if david had worked with any of the other beatles i think which... he would have been it would have been interesting for him to pair up with paul yeah because uh paul is so musically eclectic he can go mm-hmm. in any direction exactly and i could certainly see him being influenced by what david wanted definitely mm-hmm. <laughs> And vice versa. Sure. But they, um, Ray Davies, that's a great selection. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Steve, how about you? Um, well, I got, I got a little, I, I used uh, a little bit of, uh, I, I fantasized uh, a little bit. And I actually had, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and keep this short. But um, for John Lennon, um, I mean, besides Yoko Ono, who I would, who I really wanted to see him work with again, I was kind of assuming John was still around. Although, but I, I the first person that came to mind, and actually he's not still alive, would be Elvis. I would love to see the the '50s Elvis and, and John together back in the day. I think that would have been. I mean, John has always has always uh, acknowledged Elvis Presley as his influence, and to hear the, the two of them together, you know, at, at that era and their, at that point of their lives would have been, I think, fantastic. Um, another person, I like I said, I was just kind of flying flying off the, the handle here, um, and Alan probably knows this name uh, well, is Blossom Deary. And oh, Blossom yeah. Deary, Blossom Deary wrote a song about John, actually, and um, I have... Uh, loved her voice ever since um, I uh, went to a, a friend's house in Los Angeles. And uh, Saki, if you're listening, it's you. Um, <laughs> and she was the one that that turned me on to Blossom Deary, and I have loved Blossom Deary's voice ever since. And and I was I loved the fact that that Blossom Deary wrote a song about John, and and maybe wonder if maybe there was a little more there going on. But I would have loved to have seen the two of them work together. Um, and in, and another person that just came to me out of the out of the blue completely and i can't imagine how this would have worked would have been amy winehouse and i'm just being really imaginative here and i can't i you know i have no idea how that would have worked i mean uh, you know basically with elvis i think john could have worked with any of the old rock and rollers but i was trying to be a little a little weird and that's why i picked amy winehouse i would have loved to have seen the two of them together it would have been interesting so mm. there you go. Mm. Or Kurt Cobain. Yeah, not so much. I'm not as big a fan of Kurt Cobain. I, I like Amy Winehouse better than I like Kurt Cobain. But mm-hmm. yeah, that would have been interesting too. Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. Well, I could see Kurt Cobain actually. Um, mm-hmm. But I was thinking uh, Chuck Berry naturally was on my list too. What I was thinking more for him though was that you know an album of new stuff of new. Chuck mm-hmm. Berry, John Lennon yeah. collaborations. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe get Keith Richards in there too to keep, you know, <laughs> have the two of them gang up on Chuck and keep him, you know, right. uh, working. Mm-hmm. But because, um, you know, Chuck Berry doesn't really do new stuff anymore. But, uh, you know, right. there may be right. something there that those two could have, um, you know, squeezed out of him. I was thinking as well of in terms of people John has worked with, I, I kind of like that outtake of I'm losing you with Cheap Trick. And I thought mm-hmm. maybe, you know, John and with Cheap Trick as a, a backing group or perhaps collaborating on some songs um, could have been good. Um, mm-hmm. Equally, it could have been the Smithereens, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Both of those groups have basically the sound that John was comfortable with. I was thinking maybe... Before you mentioned Kurt Cobain, which may actually be a better idea in a way, but I was thinking of John and Elvis Costello because Elvis Costello mm. seems more a John guy than a Paul guy to me. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, when he started working with Paul, John wasn't as, as uh, I think Al said available. Um, right. But uh, you know, there's there's something about Elvis's cutting edge that works great with McCartney because. 
John's cutting edge work great with McCartney. But I think the two of them, um, you know, for the same reason that Ray Davies would be a good choice, you know, was Costello is a brilliant lyricist. And, uh, and I think that, um, I think that could work, you know, uh, and then my third one, because I wasn't counting Chuck Berry really since it was, <laughs> <laughs> uh, was um, <clears throat> John Cage. John you know, I thought, I, th- I, I, you know, I thought of that, Alan, and I, 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 I wondered how it would work. Um, but here's how it would work. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would work in pretty much the same way that John's avant-garde stuff worked with Yoko, except mm-hmm. that you know, John. John Cage, I mean, John Cage and Yoko in some ways work to similar kinds of rules in the sense that they start a a piece. I mean, it it may sound to a lot of our listeners as just a free for all, but, you know, they usually start with a set of conditions that, you know, have to be, you know, like Yoko's instruction pieces, you know, uh, breathe in, breathe out or whatever. I mean, it's a simple kind of thing, but Cage's, Cage's piece is sort of uh, where it's a little more complex than that, but, you know, also involved taking into account what was going on or throwing the I Ching and, you know, selecting any of a number of predetermined uh, actions and then doing them. I think John could have gotten into something like that because, you know, you listen to his, the zany tapes he made that, you know, were those sort of little radio shows and things. And, mm-hmm. uh, and there, there was also another, unreleased avant-garde album that he recorded at least a side of that there's film of him doing in uh man of the decade and i think it was called laugh or the track was called laugh basically everyone's laughing (laughs) but uh you know i think i think he could get into a a situation where say he and Yoko and John Cage get together, decide what the pieces are going to be and then do them. And I'm, I'm sure that he would bring something specifically of his own to it, perhaps as a guitarist, you know, John Cage is mm-hmm. really big on electric guitar, but John could have added that aspect. So those are, those are my three for John. Only little caveat I've got is that, do you think that maybe Elvis Costello and John might have been too similar? Possibly. That's why I think maybe Kirk Cobain, Cobain would have been a better choice than yeah, Elvis. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Because, you, know, you know, especially vocally. Yeah, you know, that's, that's that's true. But they would have been, I think, maybe so much on the same wavelength. that. Um, oh, sure. Uh, and I think they would have pushed each other because Elvis Costello's writing – you know, depending what part of his career you're talking about. I was it, just going to ask, what, yeah, which, it's, it's, which Elvis are we talking about? Well, I don't know. It would have to be. <laughs> the, the, young, the young, angry Elvis or the, you know, the more, uh, the more poetic, you know, later the, Elvis. Yeah. So, you know, mm-hmm. I, think, I think that would push John in an interesting direction. But I think the young, angry Elvis is the one that John would have been immediately comfortable with. Oh, I'm sure. You mm-hmm. know. So yeah, those are those are mine. Okay, well, we've we've taken a look at the musicians that we'd like to see John Lennon have worked with. Let's go with the other one that's kind of a problematic situation in that the fact the fact that as mentioned, uh, George Harrison hasn't been available for nearly fifteen years. So I'll uh, I'll give my nominations first. During his career, uh, George worked with, you know, probably every, you know, every major rock guitarist out there, except with the possible exception of Carlos Santana. But I've got two here that are not really and not really specifically associated with rock and roll, but are two great guitarists. Uh, of their of of their era, although theirs didn't really specifically dovetail with with John's. Uh, in fact, uh, they're probably more associated in the in the country uh, area than uh, than than in rock and roll. Uh, one is Albert Lee, Albert Lee, not Alvin Lee, uh, who is mm. uh, who is a great country country pop guitarist out of England. Uh, who is working. Working with Peter Asher at the moment. Is he? Yes, he is. Ah, I didn't know that. Oh, they've that's been great. touring together. 
Oh, yeah, they that's have, that's they great. Have... Mm-hmm. That's that's great. And the other is Vince Gill, who has been who I think probably most people know. Oh, yeah, he had some country hits in the 90s, but actually has been a session player and a, and a presence in Nashville as a, a great guitarist for, uh, you know, some 25 years now and um, has done absolutely great work and i think i would love to see george work on stage with either albert lee or vince gill or in the studio uh my third selection is is actually uh, a close a close friend of uh of george's and that's carl perkins other than the the rockabilly session and a uh you know a straight track here here or there they never worked together in the studio to any great extent. So I would mm-hmm. love to have seen George and, uh, and Carl do, you know, an entire album together. Mm-hmm. And since, since Albert Lee and Vince Gill are kind of very similar in style, I figured I'd put in a fourth uh, nomination and that would be Danny Harrison because mm-hmm. – yeah, because um, as he has grown, I think it would have been it would have been very interesting if if George had had lived to see how they would have meshed together musically, and mm-hmm. I think they would have been I think they would have been a, a great match. You know, obviously he taught uh, George taught him uh, taught him well as is uh, you know the other his other peers who obviously. Have worked with uh, with Danny, witnessed the concert for George, so uh, so I think George and Danny Harrison would have been a a match, a, a musical match made in heaven, so to speak. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to Albert Lee, yeah, and Vince Gill, you're talking more as a guitar player, uh, mm-hmm. you know, working with that as opposed to as a songwriter. Uh, yeah, more, I, I would say more as, as fellow guitarists, uh-huh. you know, okay. much in, much in the way that, uh, that George and Eric have worked together mm-hmm. over the years. Okay. And, uh, how about, how about yours, Ken? Well, my number one pick was very easy because, um, one of my all time favorite performances from any Beatle is when George Harrison performed with Paul Simon. On Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and um, those two just sounded so natural together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Paul Simon's one of those people where, you know, I-, I could see him with John. I could see him with Paul. I could see him with George. But yeah. seeing the two of them together on that stage and how well they harmonized, let's face it, John, Paul, and George don't get nearly enough credit for being great harmony singers. And you're dealing with the same camp with Simon and Garfunkel. So when you're dealing with Paul Simon and George Harrison, they sing together so well. They play guitar together so well. It's just, it was such a natural, those two together, that I, I always wished, after seeing those two together, that they would make an album together. And, um, you know, I just think that that performance was so wonderful. I just wish that they had done more. And I think they would have gotten along great. I really do. You know, <laughs> you can talk about egos getting in the way. I don't think that would have happened with Paul Simon and George Harrison. You know, no. they, they had a mutual respect for each other. And I'm sure Paul Simon also had, uh, you know, a deep respect for John and Paul, too. Mm-hmm. But yeah. um, I don't know why. I think George fell in really well with Paul Simon at that moment. And uh, and they're such great guitar players, both of them. And so great on acoustic guitar. <laughs> and uh, it just was so natural, those two together. He's my number one pick. Without a doubt, Paul Simon. <clears throat> Second one, you're going to be baffled by my saying this because I picked Eric Clapton. And the only reason why I picked Eric Clapton is that even though they've done a lot of work together, they didn't write together outside of Badge. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, oh, that's the only song we know of that's a Harrison Clapton composition. But I would have loved for the two of them to write together. You know, that would have mm-hmm. been. There's so many songs that Eric Clapton's done through the years where I could have heard George do it or play on it. And certainly a lot of um, Eric's sly guitar solos, wonderful tonight especially. There are certain songs like that 
that I, I can easily hear George being on. I know the subject matter was Patty, but I'm just saying in, in, <laughs> in that particular case, there are songs about Eric's career where you can say, well, that's very, that's very Harrison-esque, you know? So um, they were a natural pair together. I really think that, you know, whatever they did together, to me, was dynamite. I thought they were a natural, a natural pair, George Harrison and Eric Clapton. I also would include Carl Perkins as well. Mm-hmm. Because of George's love for Carl and his love for rockabilly. Mm-hmm. And I always go back to that wonderful concert called Perkins yeah. and Friends. Yeah. I mean, one of the greatest moments ever live is seeing George light up <laughs> being mm-hmm. on stage with Carl. And not only playing so well, but he was so full of life and looking up to Carl like, you know, he was his hero, which he was. Mm-hmm. One of his heroes. Absolutely. And um, there is a song that the two of them worked on together on, on the Go Cat Go album from Carl Perkins, Distance Makes No Difference With Love, which, mm-hmm, which right. Carl wrote. And it's a wonderful, beautiful song. And you can mm-hmm. hear George's, uh, George's background vocals on that song and his slide guitar work. And it was gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And I think those two would have been just a killer pair together. Absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely Carl Perkins was in there there's a number of other people i'd like to throw into the mix but those would be my top three do you want to throw a couple couple in yeah members of the band Mm -hmm. you know i think george is very influenced by the band around the time of all things must pass i could i could hear him working with different members robbie robertson you know i can easily hear that I can't say Bob Dylan because he did write a lot with Bob Dylan and the Traveling Wilburys. Right, of course. Uh, you know, right. you can't mention the Traveling Wilbury, really. Since I mentioned Rockabilly, throw in Dave Edmonds, um, mm-hmm. you know, throw in Brian Setzer, you know, the same people that were in the Carl Perkins TV special. Right. And actually, I wish he had done a little bit more collaborating as a songwriter with Billy Preston. I think those two were, were mm-hmm. a great team. And even, even you mentioned him. A few moments ago, Al, how about Carlos Santana? Yeah. There is that element of spirituality in mm-hmm. Santana's music. So I think they would have connected on that level. Yeah. It just happened that I was thinking that he had worked with, as I said, almost every major guitarist of his of his era. Mm-hmm. And then and then Carlos Santana's name popped in, into my brain and then said, oh, that's right. He never did, never did mm-hmm. work with him, did he? So, no, he didn't. Yeah, so that you know, would be yeah that would that would be a natural. Especially. I'm just wondering between the mm-hmm. three of you since I since I mentioned Paul Simon, who yeah, uh, he was on, he between was on John my Paul list. and George, who do you think Paul Simon were, would work best with? Gosh, I actually say Paul. How come? Just the 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 softness of of you know the the uh, melodic the melodic uh, style of of Paul Simon. They were together they too. They've worked mm-hmm. together um, apart from that couple of minutes on Saturday Night Live for right. anniversary. Um, they also played at one of those um, charity oh, shows. The Neil uh, Young yeah. ones. Uh, the music yeah. care shows. Or the, 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 that school, the school that Neil Young has oh, an annual. Oh, yes. The Bridge for. Benefit right. Concert. The Bridge, Bridge Benefits, Benefit. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think they both they did an acoustic kind of set. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah. But I mean writing together. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, think I, I think any of them would have been really good, and uh, mm. but maybe maybe George might have been the most interesting. Yeah, because, I think so. Because he was a little bit out of the way, you know, uh, and you never knew exactly what he was going to come up with, and and that would have um, I think worked well with Paul Simon. Paul Simon was on my list too, and so was Carl Perkins. So I've only got one guy left. So Steve, better <laughs> not come up with it. Sorry, <laughs> Alan. <laughs> Steve, who who would you have seen George Harrison work with? Well, I had I I did have Danny, I did have Carl Perkins, so those two are out. I had actually a couple of uh, oddball picks. Um, I mentioned uh, a week or so ago, Stefan. I love Stefan Grappelli. I thought of Stefan Grappelli. I think that would be really interesting. It'd be you know completely different from what you'd ever expect George Harrison to do. When, while we were sitting here talking about people that George Harrison had worked with, the one name that cropped into my mind was Dwayne Eddy. You guys know the Dwayne Eddy album that has George Harrison on it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Got, those two tracks are two of my favorite 
George Harrison guest tracks, and I would have loved to have seen them do a whole thing together. I also thought about Car- I, uh, Monty Python. If George had done a more with Monty Python, um, either comedy or, or music, I think that would have been a lot of fun. And don't ask me why I thought of this, uh, even though Paul has worked with her, Diana Krall, who I who I I absolutely love to listen to. I think they they would have been great together. But that's mm-hmm. a, just a that's a weird pairing. Uh, I I admit, not, but I, not really it makes sense because yeah. George does all those standards. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think that could have been would have worked nicely. Mm-hmm. So, but the Dwayne Dwayne Eddy thing, well, I I mean, I, I that wasn't originally on my list, but we when we were sitting here talking about that, I just went, oh yeah, it, I should have picked Dwayne Eddy for sure, because that those two tracks, the Trembler and Theme from Something Important, just knock me over every time I hear them. Uh, they're just fantastic. Mm-hmm. So, in fact, the name that popped into my brain when I was first thinking about this was. <laughs> Was Slim Whitman? <laughs> oh my God! Oh my! Since... Well, George has mentioned him as an influence. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, who knows? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how uh, how how good a match that would have been, but uh, right. You know, you you, right. you never know. <laughs> and Alan, who was your third selection? Well, I'm amazed that no one has come up with it but I'm sure it was on the tip of someone's tongue. <laughs> and that would be Chet Atkins. Because, oh, because I never Chet thought Atkins, of that. You know, George, George, <laughs> George really admired Chet Atkins. And, and uh, you know, since a lot of what we've come up with, with, with George in particular, but the others too are their old heroes. Mm-hmm. Um, Chet Atkins, you know, is, is in there. George mentioned him early on as an influence or someone whose, you know, records he would listen to and, you know, want to be, you know, a guitarist of, of that, uh, accomplishment. And Chet Atkins himself did so many different things in so many different styles and did an album of Beatles stuff. And mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, I kind of think that, um, if someone had put them together for a project, uh, it, it could have been a really sort of interesting thing. Uh, I also felt with uh, Carl Perkins that, yeah, a whole album of stuff would have been I mean, with, with all of my things. Actually, I, I'm thinking more in terms of whole albums of new stuff rather mm-hmm. than, you know, just going mm-hmm. on stage and playing or something. Yeah. But so, yeah, that was my remaining, um, George Harrison thing, and since we're probably running low on time, I will just cede the rest of my time to the next next topic, which would be what Al. Well, any any honorable mentions? Well, I mean, I I had written but crossed out that you know I wish he had done something more extensive with Dylan, you know, not counting the Traveling Wilburys, you know, just an album that the two of them might have come up with, you know, they worked together a bit around the time of Dylan's New Morning. George, you know, went over to New York and and they did a session together. Um, I kind of think that uh, the two of them might have been interesting as collaborators in that way. And that once I realized that that probably because he did work so much with him in the Wilburys and and elsewhere, uh, that that wouldn't really be a good choice. That was what led me on to Paul Simon is the next uh, the next idea. But uh, I don't actually have any other honorable mentions. George was a really hard one to co- to uh, to come up with collaborators for um, because he you know he turned up playing with so many people, Deep Purple, and I mean mm-hmm. you, you, know, you never knew when he was going to turn up, mm-hmm. uh, and it was always kind of interesting. So. But yeah, how about George and Elvis? Not Elvis Costello, Elvis Presley. Mm. George and Scotty Moore and Elvis. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You absolutely. could say that with Paul. Well, and with mm-hmm. Paul playing Bill Bill Black's bass. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask the three of you a question, please? Mm. He just mentioned Bob Dylan, and it occurred to me none of us picked Bob Dylan for John. Hmm. I wonder why that is, considering the fact that John was a big fan. Yeah. You know, mm. Bob loved John. Is there any reason why none of us mentioned Bob Dylan as a collaborator for John Lennon? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. That is strange, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe 
maybe we felt that the Dylan wasn't quite in John's kind of, you know, more rock and roll pop musical wheelhouse, that it mm-hmm. was somewhat outside of that, then um, that's, yeah, I, I think that's probably at least a, <laughs> at least a stab at a reason mm-hmm. why. Any, no, that I can see that. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Any, any dissenters on that? Mm-mm. Yeah, but you couldn't see John with Bob Dylan doing an acoustic guitar album. I really couldn't see John doing an acoustic guitar album. Right? Yeah, no, yeah. I couldn't either. I mean, obviously, yes, there is a an album called Acoustic, mm. but that's a posthumous release, which is you know a lot of that is demos. But I I really can't imagine. John, of course, who knows? Because you know how you know the what his career arc might have, where that might have gone in. You know, if if he had been given the opportunity, but at least the the John Lennon that we know, I can't imagine that John Lennon doing an acoustic album. Hmm. That of course, Dylan wanted to be a rocker, and there was that yeah. whole period in the mid '60s when he sort of was. Yeah, I don't know. They might have found common ground. Mm-hmm. It just it was a little difficult for me to imagine John it's, and Bob Dylan. It, together. It's easier to imagine John and Bob Dylan than George and John Cage. Yes. <laughs> 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 mm-hmm. He would have said his avant-garde clue thing and Cage would have been out of there. <laughs> right. So those are our nominations for artists that we would like to see, like to have seen George Harrison work with. Uh, now let's turn to the, um, well, at least one of the, you know, time permitting, uh, one of the, the two Beatles who we uh, we do still have with us. And that would be Ringo Starr, and uh, you know, obviously the uh, the the temptation is to pick people who you, would be good for the All Star Band, that kind of thing. And I tried to kind of avoid that. I tried to stick with people that um, that I thought he you know would work well with Ringo, uh, if you know if, if not in the all-star band format then then perhaps in the studio whether it's an actual studio or Ringo's bedroom <laughs> as he's done with the last uh, with the last several albums and uh the first my first selection is actually definitely in the uh, in the area of fantasy because uh, unfortunately it can never happen and that's um Ken mentioned uh, them in in connection with George, the band. Hmm. Obviously, f- I believe four-fifths of the band played on Sunshine Life for Me on Ringo's uh, 1973 for his first mainstream solo album. Mm-hmm. But I've always felt that, that especially with, uh, w- with Ringo's sort of country-slash-folk leanings, that I, I've always felt that the that the band would have lent itself very well to to, to backing up Ringo, uh, and and in fact, Rick Danko and um, uh, and Levon Helm uh, were part of the very first All Star band. Right. And unfortunately, two of the four. Uh, members of that band who uh, who are no longer with us, so um, so I, I would nominate the band. Uh, the other one is 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 actually pretty obvious uh, because you know he <laughs> Joe Walsh is Ringo's brother-in-law. Joe Walsh did produce the uh, the old Wave album in 19 in the early in the uh, the early 80s and has obviously worked with Ringo within the All-Star band and in other and in other forms but I would love to see the two of them get together and do 
do a full and and go into a real studio you know where where obviously joe is a is a master and do a you know do a full album together especially you know now frankly you know since there's probably not going to be any further eagles reunion tours um joe probably has some extra time so so i think it would be um it would be nice to see the two of them do do a full album together with uh with with joe with joe producing and and lending his um, you know his abilities as a guitarist and songwriter and whatever else uh and my uh, my and my third selection uh is uh, is is Vince Gill as um uh I've always been a fan of Ringo's vocal blues album and at, at that time he used the cream of the Nashville session pickers and the hot Nashville session picker of that of that time was uh, uh, was Jerry Reed, and while Vince Gill is not the hot session picker of this era, uh, which is kind of beside the point because that's not really what today's country music is about. Uh, still, he's a uh, he's a he's a great guitarist, uh, not just not just in the country field. He's done he's done jazz. He's done done other other types of music. He also does production, and so I think that he and uh, he and Ringo uh, would also be uh, be a great match uh, in the studio. And um, you know, and you know, it would it it might be nice to see uh, to see him work on stage with Ringo, but I am I can understand why he really wouldn't fit into the you know the all star band format that kind of thing. So those are my three selections for Ringo. Ken, how about yours? Ringo is probably the toughest because I I'm not sure if I should think of him as a songwriter or strictly as a drummer mm. or both, you right. know, there are times when I'd love to see Ringo drum for someone else. And because I've been so impressed in recent years with how much Ringo has been writing, but yet at the same time, it's hard for me to imagine as a songwriter, who would Ringo work best with Ringo has such a distinct style in all of his songs. And yet the different people that he's written with most recently on his last few albums really kind of they, they pave the way for the style of each song too they have such a big influence i think in the way in the direction that the songs are going but kind of like you al i was thinking in a country direction mm-hmm. and i i really also thought that the band would work really well with ringo mm-hmm. doing something with ringo and like you said the ringo album sunshine life for me um you know ringo was there at the last waltz i think that they he would have worked really well with members of the band um mm-hmm. It's hard to pick one specific person, uh, but I would definitely like to to see uh, to have liked him work more with members of the band uh, because of his love for country. And I was told many years ago that he loved the outlaw music of the mm, 70s, maybe yeah. somebody like a Waylon Jennings. Um, I know that he worked with Willie Nelson for mm-hmm. right one for me on the Ringo Rama album. Right. Some someone like that. I think that Ringo would work very well with classic country artists i'm not sure how he feels about current country because i never have heard him talk about any artist of today in the country feel that that he would like but there are a lot of people that you know, like you said bukus of blues i think was so suitable for ringo mm-hmm. uh, you know he, he really fits the the country genre so well and um to work with any of the classic country artists i think even dolly parton believe it or not you know, I know Yo, that may yeah. sound funny, but Not she's a, a huge Beatle fan. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, people from, say, the 60s and 70s and those those artists who are still active from that time period. Mm-hmm. I'd like to see Ringo work with those. I'm kind of curious, and I'm not quite sure how you guys would feel about this, but it might be interesting to hear him, to hear Ringo work with another drummer. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking in mm-hmm. particular, what would it be like if... Ringo worked on a project with Phil Collins. And the only reason I mentioned Phil Collins is because Phil is such a huge Beatle fan and he has such respect for the drumming in particular that Ringo did in the Beatles. What would they work on together? Mm. They've never worked together before? Well, live. 
yeah. they work together, but not in the studio. Really? No. Hmm. Yeah, I, I I think I think it would be fine. Yeah. I don't, yeah. you know, I, I, I Phil Collins doesn't come across to me as as dis, really distinctive. I, I you know I I thought about drummers too, uh, but I didn't think Phil Collins didn't come to mind. As there a drummer, two, you don't think he's distinctive? I don't. I, I, as I didn't. Well, I mean, I don't think he's as distinctive as the other person I was thinking of. I think uh, I would have loved to have seen Ringo work with Keith Moon mm -hmm. myself. And actually, not to get ahead of it, but I had also picked Mickey Dolenz as kind of a, a all-star band thing. But I think Mickey Dolenz would be great. And actually, I asked Mickey uh, uh, in an interview a year or two ago, and he said he would absolutely love to be in the all-star band. I mean, they know each other from way back, so mm -hmm. they're, you know. They're old friends. Sure. They used, he used to hang around in the uh, you know in the old crazy days. Yeah. Uh, right. As he knew he knew he knew uh, he was a good friend of Harry Nelson. Yeah. So, um, but I think I, I, Phil Collins just doesn't doesn't spark me. It doesn't doesn't get me excited. Mickey uh, Keith Moon and Mickey Dolenz would, however. Mm -hmm. So. Can the it's kind of other? interesting in mm -hmm. a way because when you think of Ringo as a drummer. You're thinking about someone who plays to the song. Yeah. You know, and it's really all the interesting fills that he brings to the song. He's not a show-off person. Right. You know, and Keith Moon is was the exact opposite of that. Yeah. You know, and so I don't know if, if um, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing to bring up. When you want someone to work with a Beatle, do you want that person to be someone who was heavily influenced by that Beatle, where it shows? Or do you want someone who could, who could take that that beetle in a different direction and have a huge influence? Well, Keith would Keith would have also been entertaining on his own. I mean, I I don't know if you guys ever saw him, but I did on a couple of occasions, and he was he was not only a great drummer, he also put on a show. He was a he was a comedian. He was he was everything. And Ringo is kind of a comedian too. I mean, you know, Ringo's very you know his humor is great on stage. So I think the two of them t together, you know, w the question is whether or not they actually could have gotten away with it and, and, and managed to do something without completely going nuts. But it, I think it would have been fun to see the two of them together. Um, you know, I mean, I, I remember seeing the who in 1970 in San Francisco and they Bill Graham introduced them one at a time. And, and Keith and Keith was sitting there banging on the drums as, as you know, as they were introducing everybody. I mean, he couldn't keep still for a minute. And uh, so I, 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 it would, I think it would have been very entertaining. So I know they were best friends, mm -hmm. but you know, their drumming styles were so completely different. I don't know if they would have worked together that well, but mm. who knows? Yeah, uh, you know, perhaps the you know the drumming styles might have, might not have jibed, but certainly, as Steve says, they would certainly have been entertaining if nothing mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, Ken, did you have any anybody else, or should we move to Steve? Uh, let's go with Steve. Okay. Well, I had actually a couple of country people. Um, I, I mentioned Mickey Dolenz already, and I mentioned Keith Moon. Right. But I had uh, Willie Nelson, John Cash, Buck Owens. Buck Owens is, would be the natural because, of, you know, act naturally. I think they would have had fun together. But I also mentioned somebody, I, I mentioned two other people, one of which I'm surprised nobody's mentioned yet, would be Billy Preston. Only because, I mean, I saw Billy with the All-Star Band, and he was absolutely tremendous. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and he was great in Bangladesh, and and that would have been fun. And also, I also mentioned Harry Nelson. I would have loved to have seen Ringo and Harry do a whole album together. Mm. That yeah. would have been, I think, that would have been really awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I mean, obviously, in that case, it would have been Harry's songs, but I think the musicianship and and it, I can just imagine who they would have pulled together for that one. But that would have been that would have been a lot of fun. I I got to say that. Uh, I'm think I think a lot about Harry now. Uh, I really his music is is really fantastic. So well, don't mm. forget Ringo wrote material from the from the 70s on up. So yeah, he sure. could have written songs with with Harry. Yeah, it sure. Wouldn't have had to have been strictly Harry's composition totally. No, but I think but Harry, you know, Harry was so distinctive. Harry's music was so distinctive. It would have been great to hear what they what they worked together on, or if they did 
right together what they would have come up on. But Harry, I think, would have taken the lead for sure on that. So, although again, they you know they were so close personally that mm-hmm. maybe you know you know as as was the case with, with with Keith Moon that maybe it might not have worked terribly well because of the fact that they were so close personally mm-hmm. i think it probably would have worked better than you know, Keith Moon but, like, but you know like John and John and Harry were close but not as close as Ringo and and uh and Harry you know, they were they were absolute soulmates. They were best friends. Mm-hmm. Right. So, Harry, I mean, Ringo didn't do any interviews for the Harry Nelson no. documentary for that reason. Very true. So, anyway, I'm done. Okay. Take it away. And Alan? Okay, yeah, Ringo was really hard for me. Maybe because with all three of the others, despite the All-Stars, um, I don't think of him as a front man in the same way. And uh, I, I'm, so I, I, I couldn't really think in terms of, you know, what I was thinking of Ringo doing mm. uh, in, in a collaboration. That said, I could see him playing on George Harrison's collaboration with Chet Atkins. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, or, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, Carl Perkins comes up in in almost all of these uh, uh, pairings. I think Ringo and Carl Perkins could have done something, you know, a full full length project um, mm-hmm. that would have been interesting. But one, you know, odd thing struck me is Mark Knopfler. Now I don't know why Mark Knopfler mm. for Ringo more mm. than the others, but for some reason. You know, it it just seems to, you know, because Mark Knopfler has that little bit of an edge of country, but Mm -hmm. also rock and roll. And I kind of think the two of them would be amenable, you know, it it would Mm -hmm. be a a nice pairing um, if they wrote together or even if they they just came up with something where Mark Knopfler is doing most of the writing, but they're collaborating on the, the full project. But my my main one, um, I can you know top the idea of Ringo collaborating with another drummer, mm-hmm. and have him collaborate with four other drummers. Uh oh. <laughs> there is a classical new music group called So Percussion, and So Percussion does all kinds of stuff. I mean, usually they're full length evenings of one composer's stuff um, one of them composes um they have just finished or are just putting out an album um written for them by glenn kochi from wilco mm-hmm. uh, who's been writing a lot of classical stuff i mean they're not a crossover group they're a serious you know new music classical group mm-hmm. um and why i was thinking about them was that, you know, in like, I think 1967, 68, the Beatles did one of these unreleased avant-garde projects uh, along the lines of Carnival of Light, but it was apparently all percussion, and it was led by Ringo. And if he has any interest in that kind of stuff, so percussion are the guys for him to work with. Because, I mean, they do, you know, you go to one of their concerts, it's not only you know, marimbas and vibraphones and all the usual percussion stuff and, and trap set uh, items and things like that. You know, they've got squeaky toys and cans and tire irons, you, you know, you name it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of think that, you know, I'd like to hear how imaginative Ringo could be as a drummer. I mean, we've heard how imaginative he can be as a drummer in a rock group, and Mm -hmm. it's pretty imaginative. But here we're talking about all percussion. And I kind of think that, you know, he could just go crazy and they would be, you know, perfect collaborators for that. I'd love to see something like that. He could actually out out avant-garde Paul. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and um, <laughs> you know but come up with you know i mean the stuff so percussion does i mean i i really love them and um uh you know it's you wouldn't think that you know full evening of percussion music is necessarily going to be that interesting but it mm-hmm. is when they play it and and there are other percussion ensembles now too but um but i think they're you know one of the best and i think that i don't know why i just think that could be a great collaboration let him just go go nuts mm-hmm. drumming is nice. his madness yeah 
Exactly. That's very interesting. I mean, it's 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 not out of the realm of possibility because, you know, because Ringo has over the years talked about, you know, the, the influence of drummers from other, you know, other musical genres, people like Buddy Rich mm-hmm. on him. So uh, so something like that. Definitely. Uh, you know, it's not it's not as uh, as wild uh, as it sounds. No, I, I don't think so. I'll, I'll tell you another another reason. I guess in the back of my mind is um, I went to a taping of something Ringo did. It might have been Artist Den. I'm not sure. It, it was taped at the Metropolitan Museum, and he did some things. I don't know if they ended up in the finished show. They may not have actually, but um, you know, he there was one one piece where he was standing in front drumming on. Um, I'm not even sure what it was, uh, maybe a conga, uh, mm-hmm. and it and the skin broke, and so his drum tech had to, you know, replace the drum or replace the skin, and so he was talking while that was going on, and and it just seemed to me, you know, I mean, like anybody who plays an instrument, you know, your instrument is is so much part of you in mm-hmm. a way, sure, and mm-hmm. somehow or another, you know, as a as a guitar snob, I guess I never really thought that way that that it was like that for drummers too. But in this incident, you you could really see it, and I thought, you know, there's something, you know, there's something that a side of Ringo that we haven't really seen in full flight, and mm-hmm. that is, you know, the the whole, you know, drummerama thing. You know, it, it's, mm. and I I just would love to see that. Well, hey. His his drums loom large in his legend. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Okay. Well, I think we've we've finished up with Ringo. Now we have one beetle left, but we're well over time anyway. So I think we're going to have to save Mr. McCartney for uh, for another time. And uh, <laughs> since especially since that's going to be. Uh, that's going to be a battle royal, I'm sure. There's going to be uh, there's going to be plenty of nominations, so that could that could fill up an entire show. So, uh, so we will uh, we will save uh, Mr. McCartney for that one, uh, definitely. But this has been uh, this has been a lot of fun, absolutely. Uh, and I think uh, we'll uh, uh, we need to uh, to wrap it up here. And uh, first of all, uh, let me go over to Ken because I think he's got uh, some plugs uh, relating to his website and to his uh, uh, his radio show. Actually, yes, on my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. I mentioned this on our last show, but there is a special contest that I'll be doing. And if anyone's listening, as soon as the show is posted, which is on a Saturday, I'm doing one for Kiddo Tools, uh, two most recent books. One is called Songs We Were Singing, Guided Tours to the Beatles' Lesser Known Tracks. And she also mm-hmm. has a new book out on Michael Jackson called mm-hmm. Michael Jackson FAQ. And you can win both books on my website. Just go to KenMichaelsRadio.com for all the details for that. And one other thing I wanted to mention is that on March the 6th, I'm going to be emceeing a concert for uh, two Beatles tribute bands. And I know Steve is familiar with both of them. One of them is called After Fab. And this is a band that specializes in just solo Beatle music. And they're fantastic. They're out of Massachusetts. And um, there's another band called Studio Two. And this band plays early Beatles music, the earliest Beatle music that they did for Parlophone but also the stuff they used to do in Hamburg and on BBC Radio. And they mix all that together. So it's not the typical stuff that you would expect to hear in a Beatle band for actually both these groups, After Fab and Studio 2. They're playing at the Hoogie Lau Music Hall in Chicopee, Massachusetts. And that's on March the 6th, and I'll be introducing both bands. So if you're in the Massachusetts area, uh, do stop by. It's going to be an extra special treat because these are two very unique Beatles tribute bands. And, uh, you know, stop by, say hello to me, and talk Beatles. That's great. Sounds like a great evening. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steve, uh, how about uh, our contact information? You can get a hold of the show at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We have actually two Facebook pages a radio show page and a group, and a group page where you can talk about the show. 
I'm on Facebook under my name and under Beagle's Examiner. I'm all over Facebook, uh, actually. But, um, yeah, I mean, I've uh, you can get a hold of me at beetlesexaminer at gmail.com if you want to write me about anything uh, Beatle-wise. Um, there's all sorts of things going on. Um, so, anyway, that's uh, that's about it. Okay, and Alan, anything you need to uh, to plug? No, I don't think so. Um, you can get in touch with me on Facebook under just Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, and uh, we're at the any of the group's pages. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and you can contact me at www.beetlefan.com, where we heartily, where Alan and I heartily endorse. Our colleague Kid O'Toole's uh, books, absolutely. Kid is, of course, a long-time member of the Beatle fan family, so uh, we will uh, go to any lengths to plug uh, to plug her uh, her fine books. Absolutely, and as I said, you can contact us at www.beetlefan.com uh, uh, and uh, uh, www.paradingpress. Uh, dot com uh, on Facebook at Al Sussman and on Twitter uh, at A S U S S forty nine. Well, this has been a this has been a fun uh, a fun exercise. At least I thought. At least I had <laughs> I had fun. And uh, for uh, Steve Marinucci and Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen, uh, this is Al Sussman. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next time.